Hey everybody, we're so glad that you've joined us today at Cross City, where we are real people finding real hope and experiencing real life in Christ. If you're a guest and you're joining us for the very first time, we wanna know who you are. We'd love for you to click on the link and give us more information. Someone will reach out to you and pray with you and encourage you and share with you a little bit more about our church. I'm really excited that we're gonna do something online a little bit different this morning, but something that's done in churches all over the world. Later on in the sermon, our pastor's gonna lead us in a time of communion. We're gonna take the Lord's Supper together. And for those of you that are new, I want you to know the Lord's Supper is just a special time that we're just gonna remember what Christ did for us. So go ahead, get up, go to your pantry, grab some bread, some crackers, go ahead and get a cup of juice or water and have it on hand for when that time of the service comes. You know, the most important thing to remember, the church was never meant to be about a place or a building. We can be miles apart and we can still be the church because it's about the people. We can praise, we can serve, and we can still give. And that's why I'm so excited that we get to come together today and worship and pray and sing to the one who is our only source of hope and his name is Jesus.
Jesus, you change everything in my life. Healed hope is found here now. Jesus, he changes everything. Oh, 
worshiping with us today. And guess, don't forget to click that link. We cannot wait to get to know you better. We've loved hearing stories about how you have served over the last few weeks. This week, you came through in a big way. At our blood drive, 105 people donated over four days and 36 of them were first time donors. That means that we were able to save as many as 316 lives. You have made a huge difference, but there are still lots of other needs to be met and your staff team is still serving however we can. If you have a need, a prayer request, or just need to talk to a minister, you can click that link that says needs and we'd love to help. To help us meet those needs, let's all continue to give. You can just click the link or go to crosscity.church slash give. Every gift makes a difference. Next week is Easter weekend, and we get to celebrate the day that changed history and the real reason we have hope today, the day Jesus rose from the grave. Invite your friends to watch with you next week. There's hope in Jesus, and Easter is the perfect week to share that. We cannot wait. I am excited for today's message. You want something to look forward to? God's preparing something incredible for us, and today our pastor is going to share what the Bible has to say about heaven. Let's get ready to hear from our pastor, John Metter. Hey, this is John Metter with Cross City Church, and we're so excited that you've joined us on this Sunday morning. And uh, as we prepare to get into our message in just a few moments, we want to take time to uh, do what we've hopefully prepared you to do over these last uh, few days as we've shared about communion. You know, it's really difficult when the church doesn't gather together because of the current situation. Uh, we don't really get that intimacy that we want to have. Uh, and communion is really intimacy that we can have with each other, but also especially with the Lord. And uh, so today, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and uh, you have followed him in believer's baptism, I really invite you to participate with us over these next few moments. So take a moment and go get the elements if you haven't already assembled those. It, it only needs two things. Number one, you need something that's like a bread or a cracker. I have a saltine cracker with me today, and I'll use that to represent the bread. Uh, which represents the body of Jesus. And then I have some juice with me today, and that juice uh, can take any form. If you have that juice, uh, then, then take care of that, get it in a cup, and uh, just assemble those two things and make sure everybody in the room has those. Uh, now keep in mind that these are only symbolic uh, of the body and the blood of Jesus, and so uh, it doesn't matter exactly what they are. I remember Chuck Swindoll years ago taught that one day on the beach with a group of believers, they observed the Lord's Supper with cookies and Coke. And uh, it wasn't really about what they took, but it was about what it represented. And so today we want to do that. And uh, hopefully you've had a moment or two to prepare for that. Uh, let me just say this, that one of the most important things that we do with communion is to prepare ourselves. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about how we shouldn't uh, take the Lord's Supper uh, in an unworthy manner. That means that we should make sure that our hearts are cleansed, that we have come to the Lord and ask Him to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a, a verse out of 1 John chapter 1. So I want to apply that today to my own life, and I want to invite you to enter into a time of prayer with me for just a moment. And in that prayer, we'll just ask the Lord to get our hearts ready to take the simple, simple observation of the Lord's Supper, uh, representing his, his body and His blood. So join me in prayer. Father, today I thank you that many viewers are watching uh, and today we're preparing to take this communion, this Lord's Supper. 
And you've told us not to take it in an unworthy manner. That means we should not take lightly the sin that we have uh, acted out in our lives. We should not take lightly the things that we've done in disobedience to you, but rather we should approach it with such a serious matter that we ask you to forgive us and to cleanse us. And so today we do that. And Lord, we would ask that you would bring to mind everything that is disobedient to you, that doesn't please you, forgive us and cleanse us. Just like the promise of scripture says, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we bring our thinking in line with yours. We ask you to forgive us. We ask you to cleanse us and get our hearts ready for this remembrance of you. And I thank you for, for the promise of forgiveness and the fact that we can come to you and ask for this. Because of the cross, you made that possible. So today, thank you for that. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're listening to me today, you can say amen at that. And uh, I want you to pick up the bread for just a moment. And uh, I've taken the saltine cracker. I'm going to break a piece of it off. And uh, this, this cracker, this bread, is going to represent the body of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus went to the cross, and the Bible said he laid down his life. No man took it from him. He laid it down, and he laid it down that you could take it up again. Think about the nails driven in the hands of Jesus. Think about the nails driven through the feet of Jesus, the crown of thorn on his head. Think about the scourging he went through before he actually laid down on that cross. And then think about the cross high and lifted up for everyone to see. And in that, we see that Jesus' body was given for us as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. He always did the things that pleased his Father. And so Jesus' punishment of brutality, of the scourging, and ultimately of death was our punishment, ours that he entered into on our behalf. So that's why we remember this. Jesus actually passed the bread and the juice before the Passover or at the Passover. And he said, when he passed this to his disciples, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. So take the bread and eat it for a moment. And as you eat that, you remember Jesus' body was broken for you. And then take the, take the cup, take the juice. And Jesus said to his disciples after the passing of the bread, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And this is a symbol of my blood that was going to be shed for you on the cross. And they didn't understand that fully at that moment. But looking back, we understand fully that it was the blood of Jesus that shed uh, or that, that solved our sin, that paid for our sin. And the Bible says this. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So Jesus says to his disciples, take and drink, for this is my blood which is shed for you. Paul later on to the church at Corinth made this statement. He said, he said, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now the great thing about proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes is this, is that his death always pays for our sin. His death gives us life. So rejoice with me in that today and uh, prepare for our message in just a moment. Join me with this word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to take the Lord's Supper today and then the opportunity, the chance to get into your word. I pray that you'll speak powerfully to us today as we open the Bible to everyone watching, everybody hearing. We pray you'll prepare our hearts for what they'll hear in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me just say, I'm thankful that you're with us today. And, and if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to take them and turn to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation, and chapter 19. Uh, chapter 20, we'll look a little bit at chapter 21 too as well today. This message is really the final message of the Best Day Ever series that we've been in for several weeks about the return of Jesus Christ. So as you get your Bible ready or your tablet or your phone ready for Revelation chapter 19, you will need it today as I talk about a new world. Because a new world is coming and I think that you'll agree with me that the old world is a bit worn out. And the new world coming is going to be phenomenal. And all the things leading up to that new world that God will create, the new heaven and the new earth, 
is, uh, is a subject of today's message. Now, we've been back through the return of Christ from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, where the rapture takes place. And uh, the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So we looked at the rapture. With that, we looked at the wedding picture. The Jewish wedding is of the groom that goes to his father's house and prepares a mansion, a place of living, a place of dwelling for the bride. And then he comes back, and the timing of all that wedding takes place when the groom comes back for the bride. And of course, the picture that Jesus gave to the disciples is, I go and prepare a place for you. So the leaders of the New Testament church were hearing these words from the mouth of Jesus. And of course, the rapture is where Christ comes back for the church, the bridegroom uh, of Jesus. So we looked at the rapture. Then we looked at what the saints will be doing once we're taken up to be with the Lord. We go into a time of what we call the judgment seat of Christ, where everything that we've done on planet Earth is reviewed and rewarded. Heaven, remember, is a free gift, but in heaven there is reward, and that reward comes because uh, of the works that we do to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So right now, you can be storing up reward for yourselves in heaven by serving him, uh, and of course, that salvation is given by a free gift uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So someone would always ask, when's that going to happen? What's the timing of all these things? And all I can tell you is, it will happen suddenly. It will happen in the the twinkling of an eye. It'll happen in a moment's notice like a thief in the night. That's what the scripture tells us. Now, we live in the season of the coronavirus 19 where everything has changed. We're almost like living in a surreal movie set where an unusual science fiction movie is unfolding, where people cannot go out of their out of their doors in the daytime and they can't go and do what they normally do in businesses and in entertainment. All that has come to a screeching halt because of coronavirus. So it can happen. Things can change in a moment. If you'd asked me a year ago uh, whether I thought everything would be shut down because of a virus that nobody can see and, and we have trouble identifying where it came from, I would say, no, that's ludicrous. That's a crazy idea. It couldn't happen, but it's happening. This week, I learned of earthquakes taking place in the northern Rockies in Idaho, 6.5 on the scale. Unusual, highly unusual. You say, well... John, does that mean that you think the end is near? All I can say is that when these things happen, they feel like birth pains. Whether reality is Christ is coming back soon or, or not, I don't know. But I do know we need to be ready no matter when he's coming back and everything can change in a moment. That's why it's so important that we hold to truth. That's why it's so important that we understand that the triumph of the church is that we are out of the salt shaker and into the world. We have to be the salt. We have to be the light that Christ called us to. And I love how Cross City Church is doing that. I love how we're reaching out to those around us in every way that we can, feeding the hungry, meeting the needs of those that, that don't have anyone to meet those needs. We're being true salt. We're being true light and sharing the gospel. Such an important thing for us to be active in, uh, in our life here on planet Earth. But now we come to a big question in scriptures, and that question is, what is after the seven years of tribulation? Let me read Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, and I'll answer those questions in just a few moments. What's going to happen after the tribulation? Revelation chapter 19 begins like this. After these things, after this tribulation that we talked about, I heard something like the sound, loud voice of a great multitude of heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the blood of his bond service on her. And the second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever. And the 24 elders and the 24 living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne. A key phrase. He's sitting on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne, it says, and saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bond servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of many peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. This is no ordinary passage of Scripture, because this is really not about something happening on planet Earth. This is something that's suspended in the heavenly places, where God is demonstrating His power and demonstrating what He's about to create for us. And as you look at what's going on after the tribulation, Reading in Revelation chapter 19, four key events 
the biggest events in human history are going to be taking place. Now, when I say biggest events in human history, I mean bigger than the Super Bowl, bigger than the March Madness and Final Four, bigger than anything that can be assembled, humanly speaking, right here and now. Because at these major events of apocalyptic uh, times, uh, more than 10 billion people will be gathered. All of the people who have ever lived on the planet will be gathering ultimately at the Great White Throne Judgment. It's just really an amazing picture of the largest most uh, massive kind of events that you can possibly imagine. All four of these are like that. So let me very quickly, with a 30,000 foot view, give you an overview, an aerial view of these four major events that happen after the tribulation period. Event number one, a marriage is celebrated. A marriage is celebrated. Everyone loves a great marriage ceremony. Everyone loves a great wedding. Pictures are taken. We always talk for weeks and weeks afterwards about how cool the wedding was. Well, this wedding ceremony that we're talking about today is the marriage between the bride. And I think that you know that the bride is Jesus Christ, or the bride is the church, excuse me, and the groom is the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is an eternal wedding. This is a wedding taking place in heaven. Now go back to your Bibles in Revelation 19. Look at verse 7 and verse 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and, white, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So here we have this amazing marriage that's about to be celebrated in heaven. And, uh, and, and the details of this wedding are really incredible. There's some things that I want you to notice. First of all, it's a time of rejoicing. The scripture literally says, rejoice, be glad, give glory. After the tribulation on planet Earth that we see from perspective of Christ, it's time to give glory. It's time to rejoice. It's time to be glad. Literally, the word means be glad to the point of leaping. This is no ordinary joy. This is joy that exceeds anything that you and I have ever experienced before. Now, let me just tell you, from doing many, many weddings, I know that weddings are celebrations of a relationship fulfilled. It's a culmination of the relationship, not the start of one. I've done a lot of weddings, but I've never done a wedding where I say, Emily, I want you to meet George. You're about to be married. No, no, it's, all, it's the opposite of that. They know each other well. They have explored that relationship. They've learned who the other is, and they're in a relationship already that leads them to this point of wanting to consummate the marriage in a final way. It's a time of rejoicing when they can finally do that, and that's the way it is with us in Christ. We know him. We're looking forward to celebrating that marriage. So it's a time of rejoicing. It's a time of anticipation. Uh, it's coming, and you can make yourself ready. You know, I, I got married at the age of 21. My wife was 20, and that sounds very young now, but back in the day, uh, most people our age were getting married about that time. I was clueless to all the preparation that a bride goes through, clueless. I knew I had to buy a ring. I knew I had to ask a question. I knew I had to be at the wedding. That's the only three things I knew. But for the bride, the preparation was endless. Kim had dozens and dozens of bridal magazines. She looked at countless wedding gowns. She did through all the, all the selections of the dresses, all the selections of the tuxedos, the planning of the ceremony, the tradition that was built in that, the protocol we had to follow. And all I wanted to do was just say, well, let's just do this thing. But the preparation was incredible. Well, in this wedding, much preparation is taking place on our part for that day. In past weeks, I've talked to you about how believers serve Christ in such a way where we're preparing for that day, that day of reward. And in this passage, it talks about the fine linen, which is the righteous acts of the saints. And I want to ask you today, as a believer, what are you doing now to prepare for that wedding then? But finally, it's a, it's a time of revelation. You know, at a wedding, you hear the, the, uh, the, the sound of the organ as it prepares for the bride coming down, the wedding song, the uh, here comes the bride song. And of course the doors open and the bride uh, in her wedding gown uh, begins to make their way down the aisle. But in the Jewish wedding and in this eternal wedding, Christ is making this grand entrance. And in Revelation 19, here he comes. 
And in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 19, look at what it says. These doors open. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire on his head, are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed with fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is Jesus, the bridegroom being revealed. Now this is a powerful picture. When we first hear of Jesus, he's only prophesied of. And then we see him as a baby in a manger. And then we see him as a suffering servant. And then a miracle worker. And then a sacrificial lamb. And then we see Jesus as the supernatural overcomer, overcoming death and sin. And now we see him as a conquering king. And if you're the bride, and that groom is coming towards you, in order to make that wedding celebration reality, oh man, are you going to be thrilled? Because he is the ultimate protector, the ultimate provider, the ultimate one who can bring you joy and happiness and perpetual uh, eternal state of bliss. That's really what this is all about. It's all about the saints watching as their groom comes to them. So I've got a question for you today that you might pause at the end of this message and ask. What do you need to do in order to get into a wedding? Well, obviously you have to have an invitation. And if you have the invitation, then you have to respond to it and let them know you're coming. How have you responded to Christ's invitation to this wedding? That's a key question for you today. What will you wear to this wedding? Marriage is celebrated. The second big event is what I call peace is achieved. Now, the latter part of Revelation 19 deals with the ending of a great battle of Armageddon, which is not just one battle, but a long period of battles. But in this battle, King Jesus overcomes the beast and the false prophet and all of the kings of the earth who are assembled against God. And then in Revelation chapter 20, the initiation of the millennial reign of Christ. Look at chapter 20. Verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the abyss, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were completed. After these times, he must be released for a short time. So we're now entering into the millennial reign of Christ. Um, it's a thousand year reign, uh, and it staggers the imagination. Jesus is on his throne. And he's reigning and ruling. And where's the church during this time? Well, we're the bride of Christ. We're now in that marriage with Christ. And we're seated next to him as all this unfolds. The king, as it were, the bride of Christ next to him. And this 1,000 years of Christ's reign. Now, this is really a time when Israel, you hear about Israel, read about Israel in the Old Testament. You know that they rejected the Messiah in the Gospels. But now this is a time when Israel has an opportunity where they see all of God's covenants fulfilled. Israel will be regathered from the nations. They'll be converted to Christ and see him as the Messiah and restored to the land of Israel under the rule of the Messiah. In fact, Jerusalem will be the very uh, capital of this millennial kingdom that takes place in that thousand years. We've often talked about the tribulation as a time of Jacob's trouble. If tribulation was a time of Jacob's trouble, then millennium is a time of Jacob's joy. And that's what's going to happen. The conditions during the millennium are perfect conditions. Environmentally, physically, spiritually, it'll be a time of joy and peace and comfort. It really is an illustration how for a thousand years on the planet, the earth can live in peace. The lion will lay down with the lamb and Perfect perpetual peace will be taking place because all will be obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, an illustration of what it could be like if we allow him to have the lordship of our lives here and now as individuals. I've got a question for you that you might think about, even though we can't cover many of the details of the millennial reign. How does your presence surrender to Christ on the throne of your heart bring peace and joy to you now? Talk about that in just a few moments. The millennium reign is a beautiful illustration of what it looks like for a thousand years. 
And then the third big event is going to be what I call justice is served. You know, people all the time ask me, when will God bring justice? How long until justice is going to be brought on the earth? And the Bible tells us not to take revenge into our own hands because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So what about all the atrocities? What about all the, the murders, the rapes, all the injustice that takes place across the earth? What about all that? How will God ever atone for that? And the next event is that time. Because what happens after these times, after Satan is released from the abyss, and after he's judged and condemned to eternal torment, we read in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. Notice what he says here. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small, that is all who have ever been born, standing before the throne and books were opened and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the dead and the sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Wow. That's a, an amazing picture of what's going to happen when justice is served. Notice the wording. I don't have to explain a lot, but just read the words. A great white throne. Christ is sitting on that throne. And then in that next verse, the deed, the dead, the great and the small standing before the throne. And then it says the dead were judged according to their deeds. And notice this line, every single one, literally every person will stand one-on-one -on -one with God at some point. And you won't have the opportunity to find a lawyer or an advocate or someone else to stand in your place. You'll stand before God one-on-one. -on -one. And then the bottom part of that passage is the most riveting. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Wow. These are serious, serious moments in the apocalyptic timeline. And Jesus foretold this when he taught about the subject of hell in Luke chapter 16. And he said, those who would not follow him, who would not believe him, who would not repent of sins and follow him, would be destined for a place of eternal torment, just like what we're reading about right here. In fact, in Luke chapter 16, we read that in Jesus' story, the rich man cried out, have mercy on me, I'm in agony in this flame. And the response was, Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and none may cross over from there to us. Hell is a serious place in biblical revelation. It's a place of eternal torment, eternal separation from God, reserved for those who do not respond to the invitation that Jesus Christ gives them of life and forgiveness. You, as long as you're alive, have a chance to repent and put your faith and trust in Christ. But those who do not will be in this place, this lake of fire. I'll never forget a guy named Rob, years ago at a men's retreat, who, who fell in a field where no one was around. No one saw him. He had an insulin attack. He had no more vital signs. He was almost dead when we found him. We called an ambulance. We tried to revive him. And at some point in that trying, that attempt to revive him, that process, he sat up. After being dormant, laying there so still for so long, he sat up and screamed the loudest and the most frightening scream I've ever heard. And he said, no, no. Eventually, the, the ambulance got there. We went to the emergency room. I went with him. I said, Rob, what happened to you? Why did you scream out the way he did? He said, John, I was in hell. I could feel the flames. I could see where I was. I was falling, and there was no bottom to it. And he said, then all of a sudden, I saw light, and I came out of that. He said, John, I need to make sure that my life is right with Christ. And at that moment, I prayed in that emergency room with Rob, and he accepted Christ. And his family testifies. His life was different after that moment. Hell is very real. Jesus tells us about hell in Luke 16. You find it again in the book of Revelation. If the biblical prophecy about the Messiah coming, over 300 promises with great detail, and all of them are fulfilled, why would we not believe what the Bible says about hell? Why would we disdain the truth about that when we believe anything else about the scripture. So hell is very real. I, I want to plead with you today, no matter who you are, that if you're not sure of a relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, if you're not sure you've placed your trust and faith in him, be sure by end of day. And the reason is because you will stand before God one day, one-on-one, -on -one, and the books will be open. And anyone's name who's not 
written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into this eternal place of torment. And I do not want you to be in that place of torment. There will be a moment in time for us believers where we won't be able to share anymore with others who do not know about Christ. We have a short period of time in which we can tell people and warn people, and we must do that. We must share now. Got a question for you. If we believe that justice is served by God and that we don't have to judge people, what does that free us to do instead? Since God is ultimately going to bring about justice, we don't have to look at people with judgment in mind. We have to look at them with compassion because we want them to know the Christ that will rescue them from this eternal torment that we're talking about. So we love people. We serve people. We share with people now. And to those of you who may be listening who don't know Christ, I am telling you this now so that you can avoid this eternal torment place later. There's one final event in this apocalyptic timeline, and that's called a place where heaven is created. Heaven is created. At this point, Jesus creates a new heaven and a new earth. And we're told that the old earth will be destroyed in a moment, in the flashing of fire. Revelation chapter 21 Verses 1 through 6. Let me read this very quickly with you. Here's what it says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth pass away. There's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. Listen to these promises. And he will wipe away every tear... From their eyes, there will be no longer any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first thing have passed away. Man, these are amazing, amazing promises. So not only is this new heaven and this new earth going to take place, but it says in verse 5, He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Now, I know there will be another series down the road where we talk about heaven and all that heaven is. But these begin the thoughts that we would have. In fact, if you read chapter 21 and chapter 22 of the book of Revelation, you're going to see this amazing, incredible, beautiful picture of this existence that Jesus Christ has for us. You know, I love to drive through the Rocky Mountains and see the beautiful mountains that God has created. But a few years ago, I had an opportunity to to, uh, travel to Alaska. And one day in a car, driving through the Alaskan mountain ranges, couldn't believe how much bigger, how much more beautiful those mountains were. The highest mountain in Alaska, Mount Rainier or Mount Denali now, as they call it, is um, one mile higher than any Colorado Rocky Mountain. Just amazing, the magnitude of those mountains. Can you imagine the new earth? The old earth worn out, decayed, and in a moment destroyed uh, by the fire that God sends it. And then a new earth created with more glory, with more beautiful features than you and I can possibly imagine. And that'll be our eternal existence as the new heaven comes down to rest upon the new earth. What an incredible picture. You know, one of the most popular things we do today is redecorate our homes, trying to make our space the best space we can possibly make. But nothing that we can do on planet Earth will compare to what we're going to see in this new earth and this new heaven. And it's reserved for those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll experience the greatest worship, the greatest fellowship, the greatest proclamation of truth. You'll experience the greatest existence you can ever possibly imagine No matter how great your life is on earth, or no matter how difficult your life is on earth, you're going to leave that behind, and you're going to be ready to do that in order to experience all that God has for those who follow Him. I love the passages in the Scripture that says, Eye has not seen, ears not heard. All that God has prepared for those who love Him. You know, God does love you, and He wants you to have this existence with Him forever and forever and ever. He's on the throne, and these four huge apocalyptic events are going to take place one day. I don't know when, but I know I'm going to want to be standing next to Jesus when all this takes place. I'm going to want to know that I've done everything while on planet Earth that I was supposed to do to be the church triumphant, to fulfill our mission, so that on that day I can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. He's on the throne, always has been, but never will it be more apparent 
that in that day when all these things unfold. The question I want to ask you at this point is this. How can a person be assured they'll be in heaven and not in hell? And the answer is very simple. By coming to the place where you put your faith and trust in Jesus, turning away from your sin, repenting of that sin, trusting what he did on the cross, just like we talked about with communion. His body was laid on that cross. His blood was shed so that he could forgive us of sin and make us right before God in heaven. For you to come to the place of trusting what he did on the cross to forgive you, to give you eternal life, is to come to the place of salvation. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe what this Bible says, and if you believe these huge events are yet to come, you're going to want to be on the side that Christ is on. The most important question, the most important decision you can make today is where do you stand with Christ today? Because where you stand with him today is where you stand with him eternally as all these things unfold. How about I close in a word of prayer? And then we'll have uh, another moment where we can point you to the question. But if you've never placed your faith in Christ, do it now. You can pray this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that Jesus died on the cross for me. And today I ask you to forgive me of sin and give me this gift of eternal life. I turn away from sin and everything else I've trusted in. And I put all my faith, all my confidence in Jesus Christ from this day forward. Be my Savior today, Lord, and be my master. I choose to follow you. I ask this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you've made that decision, if you prayed that prayer today, please let us know. You can let us know by simply clicking the, the uh, link that we provide for you. Let us know so we can help you in these next steps. Thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward to it next week. What a great message today about heaven, the promise that God has extended to us to live eternally with him, but also he is here now. His presence is abiding with us in this time of uncertainty, and I hope that you sense his profound love for you. At the end of this video, there's gonna be some questions for you to consider. Discuss them with your family, discuss them with your friends, Many of us are, are meeting together through Zoom and other online platforms, and it would be good spiritual conversation that would encourage your heart and strengthen the faith of others as well. Let me ask you to do that. And I hope to worship with you next Sunday, Easter Sunday.